<laughs> All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for being patient as we get started this evening. Um, I'm Carla Rockold, um, the, uh, the Director of Alumni Career Engagement here at Oregon State University. So when you're an alum, um, you get my services for life, which is very exciting. And I'm gonna turn it over to Amar Trinidad from the College of Business, who's gonna be our moderator for our panel this evening. Go ahead, Omar. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Omar Trinidad. I'm the Assistant Director for International Student Success here in the College of Business. Um, and today I'm going to, to be the moderator for our conversation today. We have uh, several of our alumni. We also have invited a, an immigration attorney to really discuss some of the current updates in our, in our federal policies regarding um, your particular situation and experience. Uh, so the way that our conversation is going to be facilitated today, we'll first start with introductions. We'll then get, get into some updates in the federal policies. Uh, we'll, we'll have some panelists discuss some questions that they have already curated for them. And at the end of this, uh, we'll be able to have some uh, some time for you to be able to ask questions. And if you do have questions, please do put it in the um, questions, the Q&A uh, button. You should be able to see that in the very bottom of your screen or <clears throat> in a particular part of your app if you're, if you're looking at it now. So, um, but put questions there. Uh, and if you do have uh, any any uh, questions regarding our, our guests, we will we will have a time, like I said, at the end to be able to answer those. So anyways, let's go ahead and jump into our introductions. We do have several guests here today uh, and then a couple more probably that's going to be popping in. Um, let's let's gonna do, do a quick introduction, name, um, in term position and, and major as well, uh, if you're an alumni. Um, and we'll start with uh, Kathleen. Hi, everyone. I'm Kathleen Gasparian. I'm an immigration attorney. I'm based in New Orleans, but because immigration is a federal practice, I help people all over the globe find their way to the United States or find their pathway to staying in the United States after they graduate. And I'm fortunate enough to have been working with the university for quite a few years now, and I'm really happy to be here today. Awesome. Um, so we don't have Fat 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 Fatima yet. And so why don't we go with uh, Dr. Yeah, sure. Uh, hello, I graduated from Oregon State in 2020. Um, I'm currently working as an applied scientist at Boston Dynamics AI Institute. Um, before that, I worked at Facebook, Amazon, and Yale as a postdoc. So I'm happy to share uh, more information and happy to answer your questions. Great, and it seems like we, do, we, we have Paresh now. Um, would you mind introducing yourself? Hey guys, hi, my name is Parish Soni and I graduated from Oregon State in 2021. Uh, currently, I work as a product operations engineer at a startup called Unitex, and we basically work on inspection systems. And I'm happy to help as like however I can. Thank you. Thank you. Abdul Rahman? Hi everyone, my name is Abdul Rahman. It's uh, an honor to be reconnected again with the OSU alumni. So I graduated from OSU 2018 with a chemical engineering degree and a minor in business and chemistry. Uh, currently, I worked in Neom, uh, located in Saudi Arabia, where I'm actually uh, physically now there. Uh, it's the biggest construction project in the world. I started my career after OSU with SLR Consultancy, which is in Neom based in Oregon. And then I transitioned back to uh, back to my country where I am. Uh, I am here. Excited to be here. I'm ready for for any question and support that you guys need. Thank you. Thank you, Keisha. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Keisha. And then, uh, first of all, thank you so much uh, for having me. Um, I work for Columbia Distrib Distributing, and then uh, my position is EDI, like for the interchange and. I graduated from OSU 2023. I was majoring in business management. I am so excited to be here and cannot wait to share more experience. Great, thanks again. And so, as I said, we're gonna start off with updates in the federal policies. So Kathleen, just, just let's, let's talk about what are some updates regarding the federal visa policies, processes uh, in 2024 that will affect our students. Thank you, Omar. So the first thing I wanna say is I am just one of a panel today. So I don't get to give you all the nitty gritties of how to immigrate or how to get a work visa or how to stay in the United States. But what I can say is your university has lots of great support out there. So 
what you want to be doing to get all the super details is be really connecting with your international student office, OISS. They do presentations about OPT and H-1B, some of them even with me, uh, as well as your career services. So you have lots of resources. And I will say the best thing you can be doing to help yourself on your journey is filling up your toolbox with immigration tools, having some idea about what the basic processes are like, having some idea about where the possible red flags are, having an idea of what might not work, and also like what are your time frames? What do you need to be doing to make sure that you're giving yourself as many opportunities as possible to stay in the United States if that's what you want? Or if you don't wanna stay forever, but you just wanna stay for a little bit, making sure that you're securing that work authorization. So we're kind of in a really interesting time right now. So you guys probably know by now that the US has presidential elections every four years, and we have one coming up at the end of 2024. Why does that matter? Well, while the, the skeleton of immigration law is set by statute, which means Congress, the Senate and the House have to get together to change it, the president and the missions of the president, the ideas of the president, the policies of the president have a lot to do with how the agencies make decisions on applications, whether that's the embassy in your home country or USCIS, meaning the people who grant OPT, the people who grant H-1B visas, the people who grant permanent residence. It has a lot of impact on the policies, the priorities. What are the types of things they want? What are the, you know, how strict are they going to be in the application of the rules? So we have had a really, and I would not say open door uh, administration under Biden. Biden has always been very pretty narrow on immigration, but he's been a big supporter of regular migration. And he's been a big supporter, especially compared to other, other administrations of sciences and academia. So what does that mean? It means we've had some really cool stuff come out in the last year or two. One of them is a whole policy within USCIS of supporting STEM. And, um, and so what does that mean? It means, and supporting F1 students and supporting um, higher education within the visa process. So what does that mean? It means, it doesn't mean you automatically get things of your STEM, but it means that there, that there is policies that um, can give really good support to the pathways you're taking. For example, one of the ways you may, one of the very few ways that you can self-sponsor for permanent residence is called the National Interest Waiver. And that's where you show you have a master's degree and you're doing something important to the United States. Biden's policies, STEM policies, have essentially said advanced degrees within STEM fields is a factor they would consider with that. We also see it playing out in different types of non-immigrant, meaning temporary permissions to be here, and that there's a lot more support and it may be easier to get other kinds of visas. Unfortunately, there's nothing anybody can really do right now or yet, but I'm hopeful, about what's the H the limitations of the H-1B visa. So if you've done any sort of Googling or looking on the internet or talking to other alumni, you know that one of the, the very few temporary ways you get permission to work in the US is called the H-1B. And that has a very limited number available. This year, uh, the lottery is opening up next month and, or it's opening actually in a few days, um, and employers put in registrations, and then we have to go through a lottery because the supply of H-1Bs is a little bit over 80,000, but the demand is very high. One of the cool things we're seeing in the H-1B lottery this year is USCIS has finally realized that there's like computers and internet, and you can do things online. So now everything's completely online. It's like coming out of the dark ages for immigration, which is great. But they've also passed some regulations and put some things out to decrease fraud, to decrease um, the number of, we call multiple applications, because it's supposed to be one shot per person instead of, and there was a lot of fraud happening on that. So the new system hopefully will cut that down. And maybe that means instead of the chances being 
one and six, maybe the chances are a little bit better. Right now, the H-1B lottery is weighted towards individuals who do have U.S. master's degrees. And there's talk about changing it in the future, but we don't really have any regulations on that yet. We do also know there's some H-1B regs that we are waiting, like they'll be out any day now, and they should be out in time for the winners of this year's lottery, which are going to make it easier to flow from OPT to H-1B, and that are going to give students who are maybe um, in like their first year of OPT or first year of STEM OPT and have won the lottery, a chance to not start their H until later on. That's a little bit complicated, but just know that there's some regs that hopefully are gonna make it a little bit easier. It's gonna be an inter, we, it, everybody's waiting with bated breath to see what happens in November. Um, so we are, as a whole, we are encouraging everybody to get information now and start the process of whatever you want your next immigration step to be now while we know what it looks like and while it's pretty predictable. So I think, Omar, the next question you had for me is what advice do I have? Um, and so the first thing, like I said, having a really good toolbox of information is a really good starting place. Um, getting to know the person who signed your I-20 or your DS 2019 and, and really working with the school about making sure you're streamlining your OPT and things like that. The best thing you can be doing to help yourself immigration wise is following the rules of the status you have. That is the number one thing you can do because once you fall out of status, you start limiting your options. You also wanna be staying up to date about like what's happening in US embassies if you plan travel because there's lots of things that impact appointment availability and timing and things like that. Practice selling your immigration status for your job interview, just like you practice selling everything else about you, right? Be prepared to discuss the need for sponsorship eventually or be prepared to talk about the limits of the, what you already have, whether that's OP, assuming that's OPT or STEM OPT. It's, there's ways to be creative with it. You can obviously talking to alumni is a great way to do it because they've already been there for you. But knowing how to say things like, you know, I have this really limited work authorization. I re, I'm, if you hire me, I am going to be proving to you that I'm worth this extra effort. Or I'm an international student and here's the experience I have. Maybe I couldn't work when I was an undergrad, but I did all these other things. And here's the unique perspective that I'm bringing. So don't be afraid, like knowing your toolbox, knowing what's coming in immigration and then not being afraid to sell it, just sell that part of yourself just as much as you sell everything else. Um, one of my favorite other pieces of very practical advice is lots of the immigration process is tied to the employer paying you a fair wage, what's called a prevailing wage. And you can find what those wages are on the Department of Labor website. If you Google, FLC data center, a wage calculator will come up and you can put in your occupation and the area you're working in and you can figure out what the wages are. Because I have to say, I still think one of the worst questions to get asked in a job interview is what are your salary expectations? And so this may help you feel confident about selling yourself and your skills and your degree to an employer. I say this, but I'm looking at what everybody on this panel is doing and I'm like, everybody's so smart. Everybody's so great. This, this university turns out such amazing alum. Um, of course, right now, what we always worry about the most, right, which is the next question that Omar had for me is, what do we do with denials or what do we do with, um, or with complications, okay? And the best thing you can do is to be, always have a plan B or a plan B and C and D, right? And to be thinking ahead. And so um, if you know you want to be staying in the US, right? Starting early about 
finding employers that will sponsor. There are websites where you can look up what employers have sponsored for H-1B before, what employers have sponsored for permanent residence before. Um, being aggressive about talking to your employers about trying the lot like the H-1B lottery every year, not waiting till the end of your STEM OPT time. Being thoughtful about thinking about immigration as a creative problem to solve, right? Sometimes we may have to go out to come back in. Sometimes we may have to go work abroad for an international company to have visa options to come back. Sometimes we may skip the temporary, temporary statuses to go straight to permanent residence. Um, so there's lots of different things and pathways you can be pursuing. The more knowledge you have, the better off you are. Now, immigration does change all the time. So you have to be thoughtful, right? You want to make sure that any conversations you're having with friends or alumni about what they did or how they navigated the process, that you're taking it with a great idiom, a grain of salt. And you're realizing that what somebody else did may not be the same exact path for you and that you need to stay up to date on what's going on and, and put in your list of people that are gonna be helping you in your career, not just the, you know, not just um, alumni, but also the international office and immigration attorney. Um, you wanna be thinking about like, it's also good to educate yourself about employment law and wage law and things like that. Make sure that you're being tre treated fairly. Um, so I, I think being a little bit, um, being confident that you have thought, like if you are doing some of the things that I, I see the people on the panel are doing, the immigration part is, uh, I, like I'm, I'm the easy part, right? Think about, you know, I always say, come up with your plans of what you would like to do with your life. And then we figure out how to make the law do that for you. And sometimes it takes a long time, but eventually we're going to get there. So I'm gonna drop off because I wanna hear from this amazing panel, but I'm also happy to take lots of questions at the end. Awesome. Uh, we do have a question and we'll, we will answer those at the end. Um, and so let's go ahead and get started. So, uh, and again, the panelists, you can answer this uh, at any point in time. And then Kathleen, also, if, if there are things that you think are salient that needs to be discussed regarding the topic at hand uh, on the table, just let it, just please chime in. So the first question we're going to have is uh, for the panelists uh, is what skills should students start working on while they're here at OSU? And so anyone just unmute yourself and just start talking. Hello. Omar, if I may. Yeah, yeah sure. Go ahead. Thank you. Omar, if I may start, I would say one of the most important stuff in terms of the skills is you actually need to start building it through your freshman year, sophomore year, is all these soft skills. Kathleen mentioned a lot of how you sell, how you talk, how you plan, all of these things, Omar, and I'm pretty sure my uh, alumni friends will echo what I'm just going to say. These things... It is not basically you sit in a classroom and somebody will teach it for you and then you just basically have an assignment and then you will get a degree for it. No, these things will be built up literally from your freshman year. And there are so many things that you can actually practice those soft skills. Go to your friends, have these study groups, any events that you have. If there is, Kathleen mentioned a lot of these uh, connection, you get this career fair, OSU always hosts these career fair. Go talk to people, see how the professionals they want to listen from you, engage with other people. There are a lot of outreach activities that OSU do to schools, to basically volunteering in multiple events. Go do these because those are the events that will actually build your soft skills, such as communication. How do you talk to people? How do you convince people? How do you negotiate them? So I would highly recommend that you start building your soft skills as an early year of uh, at OSU. What I can for uh, what I'm planning to say is more like um within the same domain, but I will use the work of a word of networking. So I think people 
students, undergrads or graduates, you should work on the networking first and foremost, because it, at the end of the day, even if you're gonna apply for a job or not, it starts from who you know and how you connect with them. Definitely utilize learning uh, how to do networking, how to reach out people even over LinkedIn with your second or third connections. Like ask your first, for example, you wanna reach the hiring manager of company X, but you see that your one <laughs> friend who is a first level connection with them, ask your friend, hey, can you introduce us that we can talk? So start building those networking skills. That's number one priority. Second one is creating your own portfolio. So I can only speak for the graduate part or the engineering base background, but create your portfolio. For example, when I'm hiring people, I'm looking for, first thing that I'm looking is like, hey, where's your portfolio? What you what are your projects? What did you build so far? So get your networking done. That's the first thing. But the second thing is, what is your knowledge? I need to know if I hire you, what impact are you going to create in my company or what are you going to do for us in the future or right now? Because people either hire for a specific job they don't they want you to do or maybe end they hire for your potential at the same time too so simply you need that portfolio so that you step one uh, foot forward compared to the other competitors in the market especially have yourself a website where your portfolio is and link that to your resume learn how to do those those are really going to be your great skills to polish while you're at OSU. And when you come to your fourth year, last year, those are going to be the really good arsenal that you will have when you go out to the market and make difference. Just echoing what was said back, it's really important in the current job market that if you network, it makes it easier to connect with people. And then when, so there are a lot of opportunities which uh, don't show up on job boards, but they show up on referrals. And then if you have a good network, that makes you like automatically eligible for those. So uh, like a really important skill would be networking. And just to emphasize on, on the network part, it doesn't need to start from basically professionals at the real job. It actually can start with your faculty. I get my jobs through one of the faculty because they already have a very big network and these companies or these organizations, they trust the, the talent that those professors will bring. So they will reach out to them. So it doesn't need to immediately like start to the organization. It can start with your faculty I'll echo again what Dr. Osman mentioned. LinkedIn is 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 a very important platform to actually widen this uh, network. But I would recommend the starting first with your faculty, and then you can you can go up. Okay, so if I could um, add up the skills that should that students should start working on while at OSU, based on my experience, is. Um, it can start from small things in daily lives. So for example, like communication skills. So how do you communicate, for example, with your professor, with your friends, how, how you guys can respect that. And then listening skills, it's super important because you, uh, when you want to uh, listen to other people as well as project management, because you, you might work with other teams and with other people who have different personalities and then how do we how do we make or create balance between that so yeah and then last but not least networking as well it's super important critical and i do believe the skill that each of you should have is your passion your own passion the thing that makes you different and special thank you awesome yeah uh, abdul Rahman, you had a you had a addition to that it's just the, these, I mean, one way to start these soft skills, there is so many jobs in, on campus that you can actually do. I remember my sophomore year, I worked at the Moral Union as an event coordinator. 
it's a really great job to actually have so many diverse people, different background, different majors. So you start to deal or learn how to kind of communicate with them, how do you engage with them. It's There are so many resources that you actually can utilize on, on campus to develop those soft skills that my alumni uh, mentioned them. And additionally, to add on that, clubs, citizens clubs are small companies to say, uh, non-profit small companies to say. It's really important because, for example, from the robotics club that I was involved in, some of my friends went to Tesla just because of the projects that they involved in the robotics club. Some of them are working at SpaceX because they were really good at what they are doing. Most of those skills are not being taught on the classes, but you learn them with your passion, curiosity. There's a goal out there. You want to build a rover. You want to build a submarine. Whatever you want to build, knowledge you collect throughout those projects, throughout those skills are key. And I think being in the clubs is really nice and very um, area where you can experiment and grow your skills simply. And each time when you do complete a project from it, put it into your portfolio because they become a really nice uh, chat points when you come to the panel interviews at your next job uh, interview, for example. Yes, you want to add on to that too? Yeah, so um, almost forget. I think I do believe this is the most important skill, uh, which is problem solving. Because the companies, they want to hire people who are not only smart, like um, intelligently, but also for the social skill as well. Yeah. So how do you guys like solve the problem effectively, accurately, and quickly? Yeah, I think that's all from me. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. And by the way, at, at any point in time, if things come up, just let just just bring it up. See, so um... I, I would I would say to how do you develop some of these skills is take any job interview that comes your way, even if you don't think you want that job, right? Much like playing video games, the game teaches you how to play the game, how to win the game. The more you can get confident, the more you can get comfortable with this idea of either having to sell your portfolio or sell your skills, or just getting used to what are the kinds of questions that people are going to ask. Then when you get to that job you really want, you've already got some of your, you've already got it worked out and it's, and you're much more confident. Great. So let's go ahead and go to the next question. Next question is, um, this is, uh, I guess, whoever wants to go, uh, the question is, tell us your story about how you're able to secure first or current job. I'd love to hear your story. I can Let's go first. Yeah, go ahead, Paresh. Yeah, so um, when I uh, first started my job search, it was right after COVID. So the market had been really down and it was like a really tough time uh, just to even like talk to recruiters. And the one thing that helped me was uh, one of my batchmates was already working at a company and they had an internship opening. So basically, uh, he referred me for the position. And then that's how I landed up the internship job, which I then converted to a full-time job. Thanks, Varesh. That was, that was neatly packaged. I can, I can share my story. So starting from my sophomore year, I've been involved a lot with the uh, uh, CPEE uh, department with a lot of the professor working with them as a teacher assistant or even like working in the lab or even I was doing some of the outreach stuff. So Dr. Skip Rockford, I think he's well known in the CPEE department. Uh, one day he reached out to me in my uh, senior year when I was actually doing my two minors and he was telling to me, hey, Abdurrahman, there is an opportunity from this company. They are looking for a fresh graduate. It's an environment and engineering consultant company. Are you interested? And I was telling, I was extremely shocked because they definitely asked him about what kind of skills they are looking for and then the background or even the portfolio that the person should have that Dr. Osman kind of like mentioned. 
they were looking for somebody basically good with people, knows how to talk, uh, knows how to kind of like convince clients. And then he put my name. So when he asked me, I was in total shock. I did con- I did have the conversation with him many times before that. I'd like to get a job in the U.S. just to kind of like give the experience and understand how things are. And obviously, I was in uh, in a lot of conversation with the international office that Kathleen uh, was mentioning in terms of what do I, what should I do? Is it possible to get a job? And they were mentioning to me that well, you can get a job using your OPT, and then you can basically work for for a year or, or a couple of years. So I told Doctor Skip that let me think about it. I thought about it, and I'm like, okay, well, let's let's do it. And then he put my contact to them. Uh, obviously, when I was at OSU, I was in Corvallis. Their office was in Portland, so they asked me if I could drive to them and have an interview with them. I had several interviews with them. Most of these interviews, they weren't related to technical aspect because they already know what OSU can offer from a technical perspective, but they were basically analyzing some of my uh, safe, soft skills and attitude. So stuff like, am I passionate? Am I good with people? And I remember one of the interviews, they actually took me to uh, to a baseball game just to kind of like see how, how I interact with the people. And then after that, I, I, I get the job. That's great. Great story. So it seems like it started off with an alum, uh, with your contact with your faculty. We yeah. then referred you to a job, but then the process of, of, of getting the job or the process of interviewing was much more beyond the, just the question and answer. It was a social yeah, aspect. Yeah, it, it was a social aspect. Like even Omar, when I went to their, uh, to their office, I was meeting people individually and most of them, it was like, tell us a little bit your background and tell us like, what have you done? Like even I met the CEO and then he was telling to me, it's like, oh, well, why? Why Oregon? Because I was telling them, like, I love Oregon, I love the rain, I'm, I love hiking, and I love these kind of stuff. So they will be asking these general questions. Basically, they are analyzing your personality, your soft skills. And then the technical aspect, obviously, will come later. All of us are going to graduate. All of us hold an engineering degree. We are already equipped with the technical stuff. But they are looking for these these soft soft skills and basically your passion, your problem-solving. Uh, how you interact, how you communicate, and this uh, this aspect. I can go next. So okay. my first position um, was not EDI. I uh, my first position was operation clerk at Republic Services, and it, it is in Albany, uh, and it was them. I think for three months, and then I got this full-time job. So I start at Columbia distributing as a customer service. And then um, I think after two and a half or two months after that, I got promoted to be EDI. What does it mean? It means that electronic data interchange. So instead of managing the general customers, so I um, manage the national accounts, including like the Amazon's Corps office in Seattle, Washington, and then Costco. If you if you go, if you've ever ever been to Costco, Safeway, Fred Meyer, 7-Eleven, GoPuff, and many more national accounts. So yeah, I'm so excited to tell you guys more details about my experience. I think my story is a little bit interesting and uh, worth to share too. Um, I started my first position with CPT actually at Facebook. I worked at Facebook Reality Labs as a CPT research scientist intern. I did like a six months uh, job working there and we published a paper for, in, in Nature from there as well. And um, right after that, I was like, hey, this is great. Maybe I get a job offer from there, etc." Then COVID hit and I had to graduate in the middle of the COVID. I was panicking. Like, what am I going to do? Nobody is hiring. All the positions that I want to go is not available at all. Then I decided to do a postdoc. And I applied 11 positions to get a postdoc. When you're doing a postdoc after PhD, you definitely utilize the network of your professors. So basically, I reach all the professors I met at conferences. 
each time when you meet with conference friends or professors, you add them on LinkedIn. I reach them. I get two offers back. One was WPI in Washington. The other was at Yale in Connecticut. So I joined Yale at Connecticut for two years to do my postdoc uh, in some roving robotics stuff. So while I was in there, I didn't get any H-1B offers. So I was eating up my H-1B. I didn't know this was going on, right? And then postdoc is kind of a limited time. So it finished towards the last two months of postdoc. What I was doing was like applying jobs. I applied 25 jobs, get four job offers. Uh, and one of them was again from Facebook. One of them was from Amazon Robotics and AI. One of them was also a company called San Fran uh, Carbon 3D in San Francisco. They offered like 150K at that time. I was like, yeah, happy, so much money, yeah. And then I realized, oh, take the taxes off, take the rent off. Oh my God, 50K in San Francisco. I'm literally poor. And I was like really tense and like, what am I going to do? Now I'm like one month from the job start date and uh, I was about to go there. And this happens in May and I applied to Amazon in February. Eight jobs I applied in February to Amazon. And they come back in June and say like, hey, we want to work with you. And actually the call came to me from Amazon at like 8 p.m. in Sunday. I was like, is this a scam? Like, and then when I received the real email, I was like, okay, this is something not scam. And what turns out to be is simply, I got the job offer from Amazon. I was like, they're paying great. Goodbye, San Francisco job. So no strings attached when it comes to the job. If you find the next better job two weeks from your first job, goodbye. Because this is going to connect to my Amazon journey, which is I worked at Amazon in six months. Everything was going great. I moved to Washington from Connecticut. Guess what happened? Big tech layoffs. Starting with Amazon, everybody laid off workforce. My team was like 300 people. And the entire, they, they laid off four teams, including our team. And all of a sudden I become jobless and we were doing research in there. Like what is going on? And then I started eating from my STEM OPT unemployment days. I was like, was, I was like tense because everyone is layoff talent. And let me tell you this, like after coming out from Yale, I said like I applied 25 jobs and get four job offers. This time I applied 150 jobs and get four job offers. 150 are you kidding me like it was literally self-consciousness breaking uh experience for me but what happened is two weeks left to my deportation date <laughs> i got three job offers aligned to the same day because i tried to align them to the same day one of them was apple they said we can only give you verbal offer and i said like Guys, with verbal offer, two weeks left deportation, I cannot accept that. And I accepted this current job I am at in. And I started, so far so good, let's not jinx it. Uh, but that's how I come to my current position. One good fact about just job hopping, even though I don't like it, job hopping is like every time when you hop a job, your salary increases bit by bit. So that's something you should not... Uh, settle down definitely because like work for two years three years but then think about am i wanna grow is there a growth opportunity in my current job or should i go to the next job and this was like definitely stress breaking uh, story but current position came like that and each time i had to reach networking events join networking events talk with new people, meet with new people, especially like text people over LinkedIn to, to who are working in the company you want to work in and ask their experiences. Don't ask job for them, by the way. Ask their experiences, how they feel like, what are their frustrations, what are their achievements. And then you create connection and one day they will remember you and you will remember them, right? So this is the short story of how I secured from first to last. <laughs> All right, if, if I can just press on a bit on that, because I know, I know Keisha's experience as well, because I, I taught her in the College of Business. And so, so Dr. Osman, can you just expand more on, so how did you, because it seemed like you you had to go through a very stressful two, two weeks before deportation. So how did you navigate that? Right? How did you navigate like the process of, because of, right, work, working at prestigious institutions, getting several jobs offers from prestigious companies and then all of a sudden getting let go but then 
applying for 150 jobs, getting four. Like, how did you navigate the the process? Because obviously, it it's it, it it pokes at your pride a bit, right? It pokes on, you know, I earned this degree, and there's so many things. Like so there was a question regarding, you know, go, graduating from one state versus the other. But how did that? How did you navigate all those pieces? Yeah, it was absolute chaos. First of all. Uh, Excel. I have a one big Excel sheet with all the job applications that I have, like job name, link, who is the hiring manager, who is the um, hiring a human resources that's connected with it, because there's always a hiring manager and hiring a HR person. So find them. Do, do I want this job fully or do I want this job to save my uh, future? Right. Write it down. Did you send a cover letter? Did you send a resume? Did you send your portfolio? When was the time that I applied? When was the time that I hear back? And I also like create a button in the Excel saying like applied, rejected, uh, accepted, so that I can uh, get my numbers and see what am I doing. But literally, it was um, emotionally degrading process. Like I got lots of white hair just within that two months. To be honest with you. Because what happens is you always start to question yourself in your mind with negative things. Am I not enough? Am I going to find a job? What will happen if I go back to Turkey? Because I have been here for the last eight years, right? Like, what is going to happen? Who is going to give me an H1B? These are all the questions that were in my mind, right? One thing to relax your mind is keeping notes. Like, write down those questions that are bothering you in a piece of paper go through them one by one. What I did was like identifying what I was thinking, like the question number one, is this a logical question that I'm asking and torturing myself or is this something emotional? If it's an emotional, I tell myself, dude, you did so much, calm down. This is an emotional stress, <laughs> focus on what is really logical here. Do that, right? That was the number one thing and I reach, I even made a post on my LinkedIn, which get like 4,000 likes. I was like, never happened before because what I did is, hey guys, this is my current situation. This is what I did. And right now I'm in this situation. I need a job with this skill sets, this, 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 this. If you know someone hiring, please reach me out. Guess what happened? People started reposting it. My professors reposted it. Even people I don't know reposted it. Like communities that are Turkish also reposted it. So that reach out like, even one day I got a call from Tesla robot team Sunday, 6 p.m. interview. I was like, Sunday, 6 p.m. interview? Are you working at Sunday, 6 p.m.? Right? So in incredible things happen when you unleash the networking possibility. So make sure to add everybody you see in here in this list over LinkedIn. Reach these people as a... A person who is going to graduate from Oregon said that's number one task that you need to do, right? But overall, long story short, this management comes from being patient, knowing what is logical, and knowing what is emotionally torturing and trying to stay away from that. And I also did lots of yoga to relax my mind. So <laughs> it was stressing. And as uh, Gasper said, plan B, C, D, I was thinking like, if I go back to Turkey, what am I doing? How am I coming back? Am I coming back or am I going to Europe, right? So I like, plan B, plan C, plan B. I started writing these down too so that I can at least have a future that I can, if I want to come back, I can come back or go start working in some man Europe if I don't want to work in my own country, right? That's, that's all planning and trying to be logical and sane at the same time. Okay, awesome. Keisha, okay, you want to add something to that as well? Yeah, so um, I almost forgot. I got this position from LinkedIn, so do not underestimate the power of LinkedIn. And um, what is one more? Uh, indeed. And indeed. And then, yeah, I had three rounds interview. First first one was the phone interview, second round interview. Uh, second was in person, and then the third one in person as well. So it was not an instant story. <laughs> That's all from me. Abdul Rahman, you had an addition to that? Just two minutes. Uh, I think Dr. Osman, uh, it was a light bulb when he mentioned like some of the experiences. So the job that I got from my professor, I actually, before that, I did apply 
through some jobs and actually one of them I get a job interview through one of my uh, one of my friends who uh, used to get an intern so I think one thing that Dr. Osman mentioned keep a register be logical what's the interview who's that person and I remember one of the companies I had three or four interviews so in a typical corporate world you will meet with I think the first thing it depends about the uh, order of structure but in general, you will meet with your line manager, you will meet with somebody from HR, and sometimes you will meet a senior people, like a director or my, might be the CEO. So I met my line manager, loved me in person, and then I met another person from the team. They were, they were really happy about me. And then things were moving smoothly, and then I get a call from HR. They literally called me, and they were saying, okay, we just want to book a flight for you to Massachusetts to actually meet the entire team. But what I didn't do through all these interviews that Catherine, I think, mentioned that be straightforward about your visa situation or your work permit. I thought the line manager and the other person that I met, they already were aware of the situation. But anyhow, the HR talked to me and I said, yeah, sure, I can come this weekend, yada, yada, yada. And then she did mention like any visa restriction. I'm like, well, I'm in an OPT, but obviously at the end, well, this will need to be changed. And then it was a shock for uh, for the HR rep. And then they were saying, okay, well, we're gonna give you a call later uh, later today. So they send an email apologizing that they cannot proceed with the with the job, even though the technical and the line manager they were pushing really hard. And I actually get a phone call from them like apologizing for that. So these things happened keep the tab open and then keep the register and then keep keep following it. It's fine that uh, you will apply for many jobs, but it's don't take it emotionally as Dr. Osman was saying, just technically things happen, next step, go. Do a second interview. It works, good. Does it work? Fine. Next step, continue, continue doing it. There's, it's, it's, this is how this is how it is like don't take anything personal when it comes to like applying for a job or getting rejected this is very normal exactly also like you just need one job like it's yes. all about being at the right time being at the right place if i learn something through my story it's about being at the right time being at the right place there's no other explanation for that because like you continue searching when the time is right it happens, but you need to do your best to do that. Also, regarding the visa situations, for example, after you start, after I started a job, which was my last year of OPT system, by the way, I was lucky that they accepted me because literally eight months was left in my uh, OPT system extension. I before joining, I asked them, "Are you guys gonna apply for H1B?" Which they did, and last year of my H1B didn't came out. Then they decided to do O1. It was, for example, my fastest uh, visa process, I guess. I got my O1 under two months, for example. Um, so talk with your companies and managers before you apply to make sure that they are going to cover your visa expenses and see what are the options. In Fang family, Amazon, Meta, Netflix, Google, all the, the, the big guys, they always do a very... Uh, they have an army of lawyers that collect the, all the information from the employees who need it to be applied H-1B, and they do it automatically with the system, so you don't need to worry about it. But for small companies, you need to worry about it and talk with the people so that you get that in the pocket, so they're going to apply for it. Awesome. Lots of good stories there. That, that, I think that that's, that's I love hearing all of our alumni stories. Um, and so, it, yes, it is challenging, but as uh, Osman said, you, you really only need one job. So let's go ahead and go to our next question, right? So what types of experiences at OSU, so we're still at OSU, do you think contributed to your success? And, and partially some of that was already answered, but what else do you think contributed to your success? Were there specific resources or support services that you utilize at OSU to be able to help you land the job that you have or provide you the, the skills and experiences that you have now? Fresh. Yeah. So the specific experience or uh, 
like the one that I got at OSU would be like as part of the 3D printing club. So as like the vice president, so like um, team management and things like that. But the like the one uh, thing that I am like grateful of OSU is the like my batchmates and my like the networking that I was able to do when I came to OSU. Like it has helped me so many times and uh, like it has basically got me each and every job that I've switched to. For my case, I can say my mentors were the biggest um, resources for me to attribute to my success. I had like two PhD advisors and the entire robotics faculty was very uh, talkative. So I go talk with them, learn from their experiences and learn how to connect, network and basically absorb their uh, past knowledge and experiences again to contribute my success so that I can know what I'm doing next step how they come to the place where they are at this moment so talking with people and getting good mentors is also one of the keys for me that I suggest like if you're especially a graduate student find a really good mentor for your professional life in as well as your academical life too I'll I'll add a uh, few few things, and I think my colleagues also mentioned it. Talk to your mentors and professors. Uh, talk to your advisors. You need to be sure that they are there for you. Nothing makes them happy to see their students succeed. So the more that you connect with them, the more you'll be uh, honest with them. Ask them for help. They are there to help you, and they will help you. I remember uh, I'm still in touch with a lot of my professor from OSU, even though I'm here in Saudi Arabia. Like literally two weeks ago, I was sending pictures to Dr. Skeb about some of the family pictures. I gave him like some presents, some traditional clothes, and he would even like take pictures. He's like, oh, I still have these clothes. So be, be in connection, uh, be in connection with them. So that's really, really important. The other thing is, in my opinion, the friends that you make in college, they are friends for life and they will continue with that. So widen your connection, widen your network in college, not within your classmate, but even with the other with the other departments. Like when I did my minor in business, I get exposed to a complete different network of students and professor who actually one of them helped me to get a job or to secure a job interview. So these two things are really, really important. We already covered soft skills, communication, getting to know people and all these kinds of stuff. But utilize your professor, be honest with them, ask them for help. And then the same thing is your, your classmate. Even when I was a TA, the students will come to me and they will be asking for some help. To me, it was one of the most memorable moments when I can see that, oh, I'm actually helping them with whatever uh, help, help they need. And as one of my uh, professor mentioned to me that once a teacher, always a friend. So be, be, be you use your mentor, use your help. They'll, they'll be happy to, to support you. Okay, so I think this is my turn. It all started uh, when I was a freshman. Um, I had a class with, Dr., uh, with Professor Omar. And then he told us, and I still remember until, until right now, be the extraordinary. So after you graduate and then you get that diploma, then what? What makes you special? So that's why uh, from that, I realized that, okay, I think I need to do more like outside out of my classes. So I decided to um, work part-time as if I'm a program specialist at community engagement leadership, as well as as a RA and A for one of the uh, professors at College of Business. So from there, I learned a lot of new skills that I have never learned before. So for example, like uh, during uh, when I was being a TA, I learned how to, or RA, I learned how to solve the problem. I learned how to communicate with my team, with professors and how 
to understand and follow the SOP because each community, each organization, it has different SOP and we need to follow that. And then, so if you ask that, but I just work at dining hall and, and, I, and I only get paid for 14 bucks or 15 bucks. It's not only, it's not just, it's something. Because from that experience, you will get like so many important skills. For example, how to respect your leader, how to respect your teammate, how to respect your customers, how to make the customers come back to you again, how to understand and follow the SOP and communication skill, listening skills, project management, how to balance um, your club or organization or part-time job with your classes, even though it's hard, but it, it is like when you get outside out of your comfort zone and that's when you learn do something uncomfortable that's where you grow thank you i'll, I'll echo one thing sometimes we underestimate oh i'm a teacher assistant or research assistant where i'm just grading or it's just proctoring exams one of the uh, things that I'm, I'm well known and I'm really good at in my current job is how do you actually process complicated information and simplify in a very simple way? Usually your CEOs, like I go into a meeting to like CEOs or like sometimes the board or like executive directors, they don't want to go into all these deep details. They don't want to know like, okay, well, what's the energy output or no, no, no. They just want very simple stuff so they can make a decision because all what they do usually is they will make a decision based on some evidence that it's your job to provide them the accurate information in a very banner way and you get these information or you get these skills from actually teaching people even like your study group you to teach them like if there is like a homework or something when you do it teach them try to kind of like explain things when you become a TA or when you become an RA or even like you work in a dining hall, there is always that skills where you will actually explain something. You might think that, ah, oh, yeah, that it, it's not valuable. Trust us. It's really valuable. And you will develop these skills as you do these, as you do these experiences. Thank you. Yes. Uh, just, just want, to, we're going to continue. I just want to give you, give everyone a heads up as far as uh, all of our audience, uh, just, Please do continue to put questions on the question and answer. We will get some time to, to answer those, uh, but please continue to do that. So when we get to the question time, we'll have a bunch of questions. All right, Kesha, you want to Kesha, you want to add something to that? Yeah, I just want to add um, so you guys can know that every big thing it has to start from small things, and also don't forget to um, use the support or resources that our um, College has, for example, like OSU Career Success Center, COB at COB as well. I always use that um, to modify my resume or my portfolio. So yeah, that's all for me. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and, and talk about the our next. And if if you all have something to add to that, just just pause me. But um, the next question we're going to talk about is the transition. So you were able to land a job. Now, how did you navigate the company culture, right? And and for Dr. Yimi Basoglu at this multiple transitions, right? And different types of companies, uh, which is, I'd love to hear that story because you go from Amazon or you go from a from a higher education research institution and you go to, you know, Amazon's very cutthroat and then you go to something else. And so I'd love to hear everyone's stories regarding how you navigated the, co the company culture. within. Yeah, culture. I can start with that. I think um, after Oregon State, going to the PhD was a kind of, in between step between the corporate culture versus the academic culture because when you're a postdoc you are still in the education area but at the same time you are an employee you're mm -hmm. working in there right so one thing really great about these big companies and small companies is there's an onboarding there's an onboarding process so they guide you in your first month about hey these are the tips and tricks these are how you need to behave these are the education like they start with very simple it information like security in it um and also they take you to the security in terms of the company secrets 
and uh, they take you to HR related stuff, how you should not make a joke to your coworker or how you should be very careful about what you are saying, right? Those are corporate culture because, uh, for example, even though in the university, even though you are doing joke to your best friend, maybe your best friend feels bullied, you cannot do that in a company culture. They will talk to HR about that and you will be getting called to there. So what happens in the company culture when you go to the higher education uh, big companies like Amazon, I was more working in Amazon Robotics and AI part, you need to be careful about rules and regulations. There are lots of things, but the great thing is there's always an education out there. They are training you in the onboarding. Like Amazon had like really cool training modules where you sit down and learn and um, understand what it is. And they are giving you example scenarios about what to do, what not to do. Especially when I was at Facebook, for example, I think that was the best uh, HR training I have ever got in there in terms of like, hey, don't talk about your work outside in the bus because what can happen is maybe the person sitting on your necks is a journalist and they hear what you say to someone else. Guess what? He will write down a corner section about his half uh, heard story and they, maybe they put a Facebook employee, uh, blah, blah. You might be in trouble. Don't do that. Or don't sit at Starbucks with your computer screen without protection, right? Those are all new things that you will learn in the corporate culture. And also in the corporate culture, you need to be careful about the goals of your project. If your uh, institution is product oriented you go for the product and there are deadlines you need to meet so sometimes you work day and night sometimes you chill but you need to find your own balance so they don't get squeezed it's not going to be like um it's not going to be like hey i can finish this in the last three weeks you need to divide and conquer your progress otherwise you will be in a very hard situation but long story short don't get afraid about the corporate culture after academia because they will train you and you will learn it on the way as you learn how to be an academic. So I've been like, I've, I've been, I worked in the US and I'm currently working in, in, in Saudi. Like I've had like five previous jobs. Most of them, they have the same, the same stuff. You will, Dr. Osman mentioned you will have somebody. So you will usually have work buddy. That work buddy is actually dedicated for you to help you with any question that you want. Uh, like even like, oh, how, what is the IT department? Well, is there like any restriction related to my laptop? Can I, for example, leave my laptop at the office? They will help you with any question that you want. Don't be afraid. They are happy to have you. So they will be happy to answer any question. And remember, they were in your situation as they started that job. Like currently now, I'm the responsible person for onboarding people in my department, literally like from executive director all the way to like junior staff. I'm helping them with almost everything. And I always tell them, I am here. Reach out to me. I don't want you to feel that, oh, no, I don't want to bother them or maybe ask any question that you want. I'm always here. And what you don't know is when you actually show them that you actually care, it actually give them more morale towards your work. And this is what the corporate want. To ask questions, give yourself a little bit of time. It's the same thing when you start driving. The first time when we actually sat under the steering wheel, we were just nervous, but now it's like you, you feel very comfortable with it. So it's the same thing, ask questions. They are here to help you. Don't feel shy and, and be who you are. They're always gonna be there, there for you. Yes, in my current experience as well, uh, there's always been uh, someone from the company that like once you first join, that helps you navigate uh, like for the company culture, how things are working here and basically like uh, etiquette. So some people like some companies have, if they're using Slack, they'll have like Slack etiquette and things like that. So we'll always have someone to help out when you join a company. It's just a matter of if you feel that like you don't have enough resources or you get stuck, then you just need to ask. And most of the companies, there'll be people who'll be ready to help. 
Yeah, so uh, based on my own experience, I try to navigate my company's com- corporate culture is by trying to um, understand the SOP and also for every new um, every new employees, we always have to do the several different types of training, and then as as well as including with um, the consequences. What if we break one of the rules? And then we also have like um, evaluation after uh, every three months, so uh, from our manager. So yeah, it helps me a lot personally to navigate my company's corporate culture. Awesome. So uh, let's just go quickly. I mean, we're going to navigate, we're going to switch over our conversation to some tips and then quickly go into some questions. I guess this, let's just focus on, because I'm looking at the questions and there seems to be a lot of questions uh, partially about job searching. So what is that, any tips that you guys have regarding the job searching portion? So just focus on the job searching. Um, any any two tips for job searching from each person? That would be great. I can go start. So awesome. like, sorry. That's great. No, go ahead and start. Okay, yeah. Like one thing that I cannot emphasize more on networking. Like that's the first place that you should start. And you should network when you are not even looking for jobs because it takes time to build your network. But then once you have like a really good network, it makes it way easier when you're actually looking for opportunities and it helps you find better opportunities. But other than that, uh, there are a few other things that helps a lot, a lot is like reaching out to recruiters. And there are, uh, so when you are doing job search, like you should go through different job boards. But then I have realized that like a lot of job boards like LinkedIn and Indeed, they have become so big that sometimes like even a big company is going to post a job, there'll be instantly like thousands of applications on it. So that sort of makes your application like not stand out. So like making sure you emphasize on your resume, you make sure that like you update your resume for each and every job and like you tailor so that uh, it's uh, like it goes through their system and then an actual human uh, or like a, HR reads your resume. Like that's one thing that helps a lot. It's been a long time since I looked for a job, but I hire people all the time, right? And so as a person who hires people, I think two tips are don't be afraid. The number one is don't be afraid to reach out to either people you know, or you see a company you wanna work for, reach out to them. Um, One of the things I always say is I can teach people how to do the job, but I cannot teach them hustle, meaning like I can't teach them how to be ambitious and I can't teach them how to do like certain types of like customer service and really connecting with people. So I'm always really looking for people who are who aren't afraid to just kind of reach out. And and there's been times where people have reached out to me and I've said, you know, I'm not a good fit for you, but let me, I'm going to, do you mind if I forward your resume on to another friend of mine? And so I really do think like with all the LinkedIn and all those algorithms, reading resumes and things like that, that it's the human connections that are really going to make a difference. So when you are he- when you're here at school and you're F1 or you're J1 and so your opportunities to work off campus are really limited but that means you have lots of other opportunities to do other kinds of things like the robotics club or the this competition or look for different conferences right like you're close to a bunch of you're close you there may not be big conferences right there in your city, but is there something going on where you, you know, in your industry and just go hang out at the convention center and see who you meet. Don't be afraid to talk to people. Like I, I talk, I embarrass my family all the time because everywhere I am, I talk to everybody and I have gotten so many opportunities over my career 
to either grow my career or find clients or find people that I can work with or refer work to. Um, and I and I think people want to help. People want to help other people. People like to feel connected to other people. And so getting out there and talking and doing those connections um, and learning how to, I think I said it before, like sell yourself, right? Like what's your, you know, it's, it's having a, a sentence about you that identifies you and lets people know what you care about, right? Or lets people know what you're bringing that's different. Um, and those are just, and it's, you are not expected to be great at this, right? This isn't something you've been doing for years and years. It takes time and it takes practice. Um, hopefully it's not for you 150 on an Excel spreadsheet, but maybe, you know, but I bet, I bet Osman's now, now really confident going into any job interview. <laughs> My two tips would be, number one is not all the jobs are on LinkedIn. So according to studies, somewhere around like 20% of the jobs in the world are on LinkedIn. Others are not in there. So continue looking for other websites, uh, utilize the handshake that Oregon State uh, sends email about, talk to other people. Of course, everybody said networking, but don't get stuck with LinkedIn only. Ask other people. I'm going to give an example, for, exa for example. <laughs> Uh, when I was working at Yale, General Electric, somebody from General Electric reached me out for a specific project with my skill set that they found me from my paper published. And they opened the job position for me to apply. So they sometimes, based on your skill and portfolio, your website is searchable on Google. Based on that, sometimes people find you and opens that job position for you to apply. So others can apply too. But jobs created based on needs and some jobs are not created yet so as there is a second tip goes to this uh do not give up second tip is that like always make logical decisions don't go emotional don't go into your scary zone continue applying it's not about you it's about the market all right Paresh. in the last few minutes of where you have Sorry, can you say that again? I said, would you want to add some more to that? Yeah, like definitely don't be scared to reach out. And that like once we are out looking for a job, our goal is to get a job. So we should never be embarrassed to reach out to people because the most that they can do is say no. And that that is not going to push us like to any worse state. We'll still be there. But yeah, for an off chance, like if you ask help for like 100 people and like three help, you can like those three might help you achieve like a better place in your jobs. Thank you. Kesha? I'll... Yeah. Oh, good. Go no, no, Kesha, you go, you go. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Thank you. So I'll just make two tips, one in person and one using LinkedIn. So in person, I think Kathleen, Dr. Osman, they already mentioned it. Some of the hiring people, especially the senior position, they wouldn't post the job because they are looking for a very specific skills. And most of the time, it's not technical. It's something in a personality wise. Maybe you are good talking to people. Maybe you are good in summarizing the stuff. Maybe you are good in assisting them. So show them the skills, go meet them. You have conferences, you have these career fair. Even if you do not tell them that I'm looking for a job, the way that you are opened up to them you will see the response from them and you can gauge it that they are interested in you and they might say, hey, can you share your email? Can you share your phone number? And they will be reaching out to you at some time. So that's one tip in person. The other tip in LinkedIn, when you find these job, uh, job posting, when you open them, in any job that you search, you will find the recruiter name. Go to their profile, send a nice message to them that, hey, I looked at this application uh, and here is like, for example, uh, a very quick background about your portfolio. You try to sell yourself how you can stand alone outside these 10,000 applications. And sometimes in addition to that, if let's say the job from that company, 
I would say software engineer. Go to that company, try to find who are the software engineer managers within that company. And it doesn't hurt to just shout out to them or add them to your network or just send, send a message. What is the worst thing that can happen? They're not going to reply, which is fine. You just go to the next step. So there is, there is no harm. There is no harm in this. Over to you, Kasia. <laughs> It's okay. Yeah, so uh, tips for job searching from my own experience would be knowing what is your passion and then um, knowing what kind of position that you're looking for in the future, as well as um, don't forget to build up your resume because it's important for you when you're in job searching it's like your weapon because it's impossible for the employers to know who you are within like 15 minutes or maybe like up to an hour right and then decide uh which candidate is the best so yeah i i do recommend to uh book up upon your resume as well as uh having a willingness to do some extra what does it mean it means that if you really, really want to um, get into that position, especially into that um, company business, because uh, you can see great opportunity and you can see that you can uh, be useful or maybe help other people with, uh, by contributing within that company, you can reach out to like the people or the employees who, are, who already work there. Yeah, and also just to let you know, if the answer is still no, it's just a coma, not the period. Do not give the period. It's not over until it's really over. So do not give up and get. Okay? Just keep holding your sword because the battle has just begun. Awesome. Great. All right. So let's go ahead. Thanks so much for all the tips. Uh, let's go ahead and transition into talking about some questions. And so uh, there are lots of questions and I just want to Try to, because of the much time the left the amount, the amount of time we have left, let me summarize some of the questions a bit. Um, I'm going to start with what the one is current and then go back because there's a couple of them that are a bit deeper. Um, so I guess talk talk about uh, can, the question is um, there's layoffs right current a lot of a lot of layoffs in the tech industry, robotics industry, industry engineering, and and other other industries as well. So can you talk about um, any tips regarding to how to navigate the recent layoffs and uh, what things to how to mitigate those uh, layoffs? I, I can't say the layoffs, but finding a job. I can say something about that, I guess. So layoffs are uh, um, how do you put this? Layoffs are shift of talent. So one company's output is other companies input and there are always new companies hiring we just you just don't know because you're focusing on the layoffs you're just like looking like this in my case that was the same thing too because everyone was shutting off but i was able to find these x amount of jobs too and i applied because each time when big companies lay off like ibm google facebook these guys are going to new jobs when this layoff happened end of 2022, most of these computer scientists and coders are get hired by car companies because now car companies want to create great software. There's a big shift of talent from industry to industry. So it's about looking where the people are going. Like see, if, if you continuously looking at the LinkedIn, see the people who get laid off two weeks ago where he is getting hired next, right? When you look at that transitions, you can see where the people are going in your industry because every time it's a shift, like even one of the companies that I was working at when layoff happened, we literally called the company who made the layoff. Hey, you laid off these people. We would like to let them know that we are going to do a workshop to meet with them. And we met with all the laid off people and start co having conversation. And with the people who we see the uh, talents fit, we hire them. So it's always about who is hiring, who is laying off, shift of talent. That's what I can say. Just you need to find the current where it is going. Uh, 
All right. Uh, this seems like if you want to add to that too as well, uh, Abdullah Rahman and, and Keisha, to let me know. Well, let's just shift over to the conversation of OPT, right? Um, and so I think, Abdul Rahman, you kind of had that experience, right? So you're going through the interview process, and I'm not sure if they if they uh, they were listening to you, the person to ask a question, but you were going through the interview process, and then they they found out I'm in an a, I'm in an OPT, and so there was a question about uh, if if I have a company that that I have you know that doesn't want to hire me with the H1B, how do you navigate that conversation? Uh, and then there's another part of that, another question, which is how do you navigate the conversation of getting hired with an OPT? So those those two questions are in the table. Yeah. So Kathleen, you can correct me if, if I say anything wrong. So the first year, if you're OPT, you can apply if you are a STEM major, even if you do not get a job. So when you get into that job interview, just be straightforward with them. Hey, I'm in an OPT as a STEM my first year I can get it and then I can extend it for an additional two years. So you can be straightforward with them that you as a company, you have three years to test me whether I'm actually worth it to be, uh, to sponsor all the visa and all these kind of stuff. So one, be straightforward with them. And two, they will, they will, be, they will be straightforward with you. So for example, my company, SLR that I used to work with, I'm so thankful for them, amazing people. The first year, they said, okay, get your OPT. And then when I extended my OPT for the additional two years, they didn't wait till the last year of my OPT. From the second year, they immediately started the conversation. They said, hey, you, you proved to us you are really good. We're going to start processing your, your, your visa. Now, some of you might ask, well, you are back to Saudi. I mean, due to family issues, I have to kind of like leave, leave the US and come back. But be straightforward with them. You get the option for, for the OPT and they will be straightforward with you. I mentioned the story about the previous company. They I reached all the way to the flight ticket and they said, oh, we're not going to get it. It's fine. Go back. Thank you. So, that's, so the first thing is, is your first year of OPT after you graduate, your regular OPT, you're right. You can use it for any employer, any job, as long as it's related to your degree. And so really use your first year of regular OPT to your advantage. Try out different jobs, try out different employers. Um, I know some of you are like, you're so, I'm like, it's like you're far more worried about getting a job than the immigration parts. You need to be worried about the immigration parts. And it's funny, right? You go to these job fairs and the recruiters don't necessarily know the immigration policies of the company that they're out there sponsoring. Um, or that they're talking about. Obviously, the big companies, the Apples, the Googles, the Meta, right? They've got they know they've got the immigration stuff wired. So do universities, healthcare industries. But you know, you're don't don't ignore small companies. I find that small companies get really invested in their employees. They get really invested, and and they're going to take the chance on you. They're going to take the chance on the immigration part. Also, remember. You may hear the numbers about how much the immigration process costs, right? The filing fees, the lawyer's fees. And for you, a student, it sounds like a lot, a lot of money. But I guarantee for Apple, it's no money, right? The cost of these processes for an employer are the cost of doing business. And it's, it's, it's not usually going to be the thing that makes or breaks their decision. But there's going to be employers out there who just have a policy of we don't sponsor or and and no matter how much your direct supervisor loves you, they're not going to be able to change that policy. So you need to go. You need to be looking out for yourself. If you've had a conversation with your employer and they've said, we're not going to put you in the H-1B lottery, then you need to be looking for a job an employer who will, if that's where you see your path, right? Don't also, there's a very interesting scenario on that I want to add is sometimes some of the small businesses do this. Hey, I'm going to deduct it from your salary. That's Which also is your not sign. not okay, right? It's not that's okay. That's also your sign to move to the next job. That's right. Absolutely right. They should, they have to be paying you the prevailing wage. Co passing the cost on to you is not necessarily lawful in some situations. And so that's what I'm saying. It's also good to know your rights and know what you're worth and, and all of those things. How do you, um, you know, and so it's, it's a chicken and egg 
unfortunately scenario, or we also call it a catch 22, right? Where it's like, you need to be working for them to convince them to do the sponsorship, but you don't want to, you can't work for them unless you have the sponsorship. And that is why doing, if you can, doing CPT, meaning curricular practical training while you're an undergrad, getting these personal relationships, getting these projects, get using your OPT time to your advantage. And also knowing what's out there in terms of alternate options, right? There's not a lot of ways you can self-sponsor, but there's some. Um, and knowing what those look like and or knowing how to start these conversations about permanent residence and how H-1B, knowing the selling points, right? I'm going to work really hard. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And also understanding that for an employer, you can sometimes say to them, listen, this immigration process could tie me to you for three years, five years. In this market, having an employee who's going to stick around for five years, like that's unheard of. Like, People change jobs all the time, right? Like two, like two years is what I think most employers think they're going to have an employee for. So like I said, having all the information in your toolbox and then converting it into a positive is the way you go about finding the employers. Finding employers who are willing to sponsor alumni, 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 alumni. Like that's your number one resource for really finding companies. But I would say absolutely, and I repeat again, don't write off small companies. Um, almost all of my employers are small companies and not, and they are willing to start early on the process. They're willing to try over and over again. They're willing to be creative um, because they really get connected to you as a person. And they don't always see you as sort of a replaceable cog in the machine. So um, there's there can be lots of ways to navigate it. Kathleen, even it's a lot when they started, they were a small company and they were straightforward with me. They told me, you are the first employee that we're going to go through the process. So bear with us. It was yep. me and then another another girl who used to be my uh, my classmate. We were both international. They We went both through the same process. So small yeah. company, they are actually interested to, to, to help and go and go the extra mile with you. And then so I, I also find, and then I find these companies who've gone through the process and have ended having it work out, right? Or they've got had a great exactly. employee. They're more willing. They're the next time it's a it's they don't even think about it. It's of course we'll do it. Yeah, that's it's okay. We can we can try it out. Yeah, there's a really big prevailing question, um, and we get a lot. Um, and by the way, for for th those that have a lot of visa questions, we will have another event where we'll have Kathleen and we'll just. We'll focus on all the, the policies, all of the different types of ABCDs of the visas. Um, and so, but there is one salient to this conversation now, which is what is the best way to answer the question? Do you require sponsorship visa now slash in the future? That's usually a question through the application process. Yeah. So, okay. So employers in the United States are not supposed to ask certain questions, right? They get in trouble. It's discrimination. They can't ask. Are you a citizen of the United States? They're not supposed to ask like, what country are you from? They're not supposed to ask those like in the preliminary question interviews, right? Or like marital status or things like that. What they can ask is something along the lines of, do you have unlimited work authorization to work for any employer? And then will you require sponsorship in the future? you have such a small window of OPT, right? If you don't have a STEM field, you have one year. If you have a STEM field, you have three years. That is not a lot of time in immigration. You don't have time to dance with employers who don't want to do the process, right? And so you need to be really upfront. So how do you answer it? Well, I think it also depends on what you want. Do you want it to stay in the US? Do you want to be here long-term? Are you just trying to get a year or two of experience before you go back home? So if it's, I just I just really want a couple of years of really good experience because I know I can turn that into a good job back home. 
then that's what you say. No, I, I'm not going to need. Uh, I'm not going to need sponsorship. I have this status for three years. I'm exploring some things on my own. But what I really want to do is mil is get as much as I can out of this time. I'm going to be really loyal. I'm going to be doing this. I'm going to be doing that. Right. And if it is the sponsorship, yeah, I have OPT that doesn't require anything from you. In STEM, you know, I I need to be working on an E-Verify employer. And eventually I'm going to be interested in H-1B sponsorship or permanent residence. So I'm going to be doing everything I can, can to convince you to take those steps, right? To meet your requirements to do those things for me. I think you just kind of have to, like, and if you're educated about the process, it's enough to, um, I think, if you, because a lot of times the employers don't know the differences, right? They they hear sponsorship and they think, oh, that means I have to advertise. I have to do this. I have to do that. And they don't understand the requirements that are different between, per, between permanent residence and H-1B and this. And so if you can sort of just like, you know, if you can at least point them in some right directions, you know, and have that information in the beginning, then I think that can open the door for you to kind of move forward to the first steps. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, so just uh, thanks, thanks to all the guests, just to kind of summarize all the things we've talked about today, right? We, we talked about um, not giving up. We talked about being able to uh, have focus on your, your, your uh, soft skills. We talked about uh, being able to, to network, right? Being able to connect with the folks that you're currently with, being able to utilize the resources here at OSU, and more importantly, not give up, right? Hopefully, the, you you, get, you learn some stories today that will keep you motivated. Um, and as usual, uh, go Beavs! Have a good night, and thanks so much for all all of our alumni and guests. See you. Thank you, alumni. Thank you all so much. All you alumni are so inspiring. Make sure you follow up on, with everyone on LinkedIn. We'll see you. Exactly. Thanks, guys. Go Beavs! Go Beavs! Go Beavs.